Good evening, good evening. We're so glad you're here. Uh, we still have some people coming on in, so just make yourselves at home, find a seat. We're glad you're here. Um, if this is your first time here at Park Cities, we want you to know how glad we are. I've got to meet a few of you, but we're glad that you're here. Um, if you need help finding anything, if there's people with welcome badges and shirts on, just ask them for help and we'll, we'll get you what you need. Um, make sure to stick around after our lecture tonight because we're gonna have a book signing and books for purchase uh, for $15 in the commons. And we have some light bites and snacks and drinks. So please join us after. Um, we will be having a Q&A following Dr. Luritz's um, lecture. And so make sure that you text your questions to this number on the screen. Text your questions here, and we will be taking a few questions from the audience, as many as we can fit in. Uh, and, and Brian will tackle those for us, as many as we can get to. So we are glad you're here. I have this book right here, Insider Outsider, and it happens to be a signed copy. And so we're gonna give this away to somebody out here tonight. Uh, so we thought it might be fun in a crowd this size, there's gotta be somebody with an October birthday. So raise your hand if you got an October birthday. All right, we got a few, we've got a few. All right, is there anybody with a birthday this week? Oh, back here? Anybody else? Tuesday, is your beaters is this week? All right, come on up, this is your book. Let's give him a round of applause, everybody. And this is, our, this is our amazing church planter. This guy's planted a church in Cedar Hill. We are proud of you. There you go, dude. Woohoo! <laughs> it's signed too, so it's the best kind. Um, we are glad that you're here tonight, and we, uh, we're all in for a treat tonight to hear from, from Dr. Loritz. Um, we thought it might be a really great way to start the night, to get a little context of this conversation about, um, about race and the gospel. And so we're going to watch a short video from Pastor Jeff Warren, our senior pastor here at Park Cities. Uh, we'll watch that now to give us a little context about the history of racism in Dallas and a little bit about how Park Cities has intersected the conversation over the last few decades. So let's watch that now. God has called us to do his will in Dallas as it is in heaven. In fact, that was Jesus' prayer, that we would live our lives in such a way that his will would be accomplished through us. You know, I love the city of Dallas, and you're probably like me, man. I love the activity in the city. I love the sports. I love the food. I love the people of Dallas. You know, God has called us as his people, as Christians here in our city, to live in such a way for the flourishing for the righteousness, for the, the good of the city. In fact, in Ephesians 2, he tells us that all of this starts with the gospel, what Christ has done for us. He says in Ephesians 2 that, uh, that he has broken down the hostility between us and God, first of all. He says, through one man, by the way of the cross, he has given his life for us so that we could have a relationship with him. Then he goes on to say that through this one man, through the act of Jesus on the cross and his life given for us, that he's broken down the hostility that exists between us and other people. He says that the, the two have become one. This is Jesus' prayer in, in John 17, where he says he wants his people to be one and that people would know that we're one because of the way we love each other. You know, too often, however, the church is divided. Many people have said that really Dallas is the tale of two cities. We have what could be called over the years really the more affluent white, if you will, and then impoverished sections of the, of the southern part of our city that are, are not uh, flourishing as God would have them. And so he's called us to be a part of bridging that gap. You know, we have a long history here of racial inequality and injustice and a dark history really here in Dallas. You may not know that at Maine and Ackard, Alan Brooks in 1910 was drugged from the courthouse by a group of white people, and he was lynched right there at the corner of Maine and Ackard. He was hanging from a pole that was there at the Elks Arch that ironically said, welcome to Dallas. 5,000 people watched it take place that day, among them children. Uh, they made postcards and what we would call selfies, pictures with Alan Brooks' body hanging in the background. At uh, the state fair in 
1923, it was the, uh, it was Ku Klux Klan Day at the State Fair. On that day, 150,000 people showed up, one of the largest crowds ever in the history of the State Fair of Texas on a weekday. That night, uh, they initiated thousands uh, of young men into the KKK. At that time, Dallas was arguably the most racist city in America. One out of every three eligible white men were a part of the KKK. So we have a long history uh, and it goes on. Not long after that, we saw, we saw the redlining of certain sections, areas in our city where black people couldn't take out loans or, or, or buy houses. And so we have this great divide. I say all this because our history matters, not simply so that we wouldn't repeat it again, but so we understand where we are. And so as we understand what's happened in our city, we step into that with knowledge and with grace and with love and the determination to make a difference. You know, in my own life, I read Dr. King's a letter from a Birmingham jail as a young pastor, and it changed my life. In it, he says, the problem's not the KKK. The problem's not the White Citizens Council, which was a white supremacist group at the time. He's writing, in fact, to white clergy, white leaders, all of us who have a place of influence, and all of us do. And he says the problem is not those extremist groups. The problem is what he called the white moderate, the person who does have an impact or a platform to make a difference who refuses to do so. I'm seeing that in our day. And God has called us as people of influence to make a difference in our city. And so we want to encourage you to join us as we have sought in recent days to make a difference. You know, our church, Park City's Baptist Church, has a long history of being advocates and, and, and those who would fight for justice in our city. Even Dr. Howard, way back when he was pastor, used to say, everybody, somebody. And it was a part of his way of saying, hey, every person mattered, all races, all people in the city mattered. And then Dr. Pleitz, I remember, when I was a young uh, youth minister and serving with him, he had a, had a friendship with Dr. E.K. Bailey, who was the pastor, prominent black pastor at the Concord Missionary Baptist Church. Well, over time, many of you know, Brian Carter and I, the pastor at Concord Church, have become dear friends and we've pulled together the Dallas clergy and so many leaders now who are making a difference. It is exciting to see. And our church has been leading the way. And we're challenging you to do more. What can you do? You can go to our website and be educated, first of all. We educate ourselves regarding the history of our city and our nation. We educate mostly through the scriptures to understand our role in bringing about justice and love and grace across our city. We can also pray, very intentionally pray for God to use us every single day. And then we can engage, we can get involved to make a difference. So I hope that you'll go to our website, check it out. Join the work of God for the flourishing of our city as we see his will done in Dallas as it is in heaven. All right, all right. Hey, we are so excited that you're here tonight. And I am so grateful to have the privilege of introducing our speaker uh, you know, this is our second installment of Conversations Worth Having, and we're going to have some fun tonight. We're going to hear from Brian for a bit, and then we're going to have a Q&A. You probably know that. Then you can ask some questions, and uh, we're going to have a great time together. Uh, Dr. Brian Loritz um, is one of my heroes, and it's been fun. Uh, we first met, I think we met in New York City uh, some time ago at Movement Day years ago, and then um, at, uh, gosh, it was in Charleston at the anniversary of the, uh, the, the massacre of, uh, of the nine at the Emmanuel, Mother Emanuel Church there. Um, Brian has been an influence in my life in big ways. He wrote a book years ago. He's written about seven or so books, working on a new one. Um, but he wrote a book called Letters to a Birmingham Jail that he edited along with others who wrote letters to Dr. King right about the 50th anniversary there just prior to that and um, you know how, how we might speak to him. He wrote the letter from the jail and now here's what's happening in this time. I remember reading that book and impacting my life. He wrote a book called Insider Outsider you've heard about tonight along with others. He's recently, his most recent book is a book on fatherhood, right? The dad, the father, 
The Dead Difference. The Dead Difference is a great book as well. He's a prolific writer, speaker on this topic. We, we are so grateful to have him here. Uh, one of the lead thinkers when it comes to the multi-ethnic church, a dream and vision that we have here at Park City. We know that not all of you are members here, and we're so glad that you're here tonight. Uh, we are just grateful to offer this to, to the city and the leaders across our city. But tonight is a great privilege um, for me to, to welcome our friend, Dr. Brian Loritz. What I want to do is, is pray and then uh, just ask the Lord to bless this time. And then we're going to have him come up and share. Okay, so let's, let's do that. Would you just close your eyes and, and pray with me? Lord God, we, we thank you so much for the privilege that we have now to look into your word. I pray that you would open our minds, open our hearts tonight. I pray that you would use uh, Dr. Loritz to speak into our hearts. Lord, my prayer is that in a crowd this size that we would, we would never be the same again and we would be difference makers in our city and really around the world. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bless uh, Brian Bless him as he speaks. I pray for Corey and his boys, even now, that you would just bless his family. I pray, Lord, that tonight that uh, your spirit would speak, that, that Jesus, you would be exalted. We'd all be drawn closer to you as a result of being together here tonight. And so we give you the evening with hearts open wide for you to speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let's welcome uh, Dr. Brian Loritz. Here we go. What a great honor and joy it is to be here with you all. I was glad when they said unto me, let us come to Dallas and uh, go to Park City's church uh, and to just uh, have a conversation with you uh, about the intersection of the gospel and, uh, and race. And so I'm excited to be able to jump in there with you. Absolutely love your pastors. You mentioned um, one of my best friends on the planet is Brian Carter. Uh, and so uh, if Brian likes you, I like you. Uh, and so I, I ran into, uh, as, as, uh, as the pastor was just saying, I uh, ran into him at, uh, in New York City, then later on in, in Charleston. And you know, you, you do enough of these things, uh, and sometimes you leave going, ah, I'm not sure. Um, because diversity, uh, for some, has become a church growth technique. You know, it's, it's just something done out of obligation, um, you know, where you, you just kind of guilt people into some stuff. But I'm just like, are you personally all in? Uh, I don't get that with, uh, with Pastor Jeff. Uh, I get a genuine sense uh, of him being all in, and we're on this journey together. Uh, I, I do want to just uh, say this to you. Um, this is not angry black man time. All right, uh, uh, one of my staff guys said to me some years ago, Brian, if you could live any time in world history, when would it be? I said, as a black man? Now, like 1753 wasn't good for me, 1853 wasn't good, 1953 wasn't good. We've got a lot of work to do, uh, but I'm incredibly, incredibly hopeful. So I don't come here uh, out of anger. Um, look, I just sold a home in the Bay Area and moved to Raleigh. I'm not angry. Um, so I'm not coming here to try to guilt, guilt anybody or whatever. You don't owe me anything. But I do come from a place of, of deep-seated passion. So I want to share with you for a few moments uh, out of Ephesians chapter 2. I don't see a clock on me, uh, which typically there, there is, uh, which is normally cruel and unusual punishment to a chocolate preacher, um, but we will be done by about 7.15 or so, 7.20, and then we'll get into a conversation. Ephesians 2, let me just share uh, some thoughts out of here. The guy who writes this, his name is Paul. Paul says this beginning in verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. If I was preaching this uh, in an urban setting in the 90s, I'd call it naughty by nature. 
Some of you got that. Like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raise us up with him and seat us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Then again for effect, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast for we are his workmanship. Greek word poema, from which we get the English word poem from. I'm thinking of my mother now. Um, you know, her mother had had two abortions uh, prior to my mother uh, being born. And I just sit here, man, she's God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Whenever I'm around my father, I I always quote a a verse to him. It's a a verse that I think um, uh, every adult child should be able to quote to their to their parents, especially as their parents are getting older. It's Proverbs 13, 22. A good man lives, leaves an inheritance to his children's children. <laughs> Every time I'm with my father, Proverbs 13, 22 just comes spilling out of my mouth. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. I, I always ask him kind of a rhetorical question. Uh, are you a good man, Dad? Are you a good man? Well, as is the occasion, a couple years ago, we're sitting down having a bite to eat at Cheesecake Factory there on the north side of town in Atlanta where my dad lives. And tongue in cheek, I just kind of quote Proverbs 13, 22, ask him if he's a good man. He responds by saying, man, it's funny you bring that up right now. I've just made some changes to the will. Now, he's got my attention, right? And so dad says, look, man, it's kind of interesting. I sit down with my lawyer and my lawyer says, hey, Dr. Loritz, I see you've got four kids and uh, excited to go through this um, uh, process of uh, amending your will, but you need to understand something. I, I see that three of your four kids are, are biological and you need to understand Georgia state law is very clear. At any given point, you can edit out of your will, um, you know, your biological kids, but I see your youngest child is adopted. You need to know, uh, Dr. Loritz, that Georgia state law also stipulates that at no given point can you ever edit out of your will your adopted child. That child is secure. Adoption, the way that the Georgia state legal system looks at it is, it's not second-class citizenship. It is first-class security. When we come to the book of Ephesians, Paul opens up by saying when we got saved, we were adopted into the family of God. And then right on the heels of that, he says, and we were sealed with the precious Holy Spirit. The idea of the sealing of the Holy Spirit, it is the idea of security. Adoption in the kingdom of heaven is somewhat like adoption in the state of Georgia. It is not second-class citizenship. It is first-rate security. How were we adopted? Ephesians 2, the first 10 verses, really gets to this. 
He says, I want you to understand that prior to coming to Christ, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Here is Paul in Ephesians chapter 2. He's giving us the brilliance and the beauty of the gospel. But before he can really get us to appreciate the beauty of the gospel, he has to give us the ugliness of our sin. When I was in seminary, I was po. Not poor. I couldn't afford the other O and the R. I was... I was Poe, Poe and in love. Uh, I was in love with a woman who's now my wife. That's a bad combination. Uh, I, I remember uh, looking for her, uh, um, her engagement ring, and I would, I would go around to various jewelers there looking for an engagement ring, and uh, I noticed that all the jewelers kind of did the same thing. They would never take those diamonds, once I gave them the specs, and just plop them down on the counter. Instead, what they would do is they would roll out a black piece of velvet cloth And then they'd put the diamonds on top of that. And against the backdrop of that black piece of velvet cloth, it would make the diamonds radiate all the more. In Ephesians 2, that's what Paul is doing. He's showing us the diamond, the beautiful diamond of the gospel. But in order to get us to appreciate it, he's got to roll out the black piece of velvet cloth of our sins. He says, you need to know you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and you were by nature children of wrath. Now, some of you might be here, and you wouldn't call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ. You go, wait a minute, I thought Christians believed that God loved us. Now you're saying that we are by nature objects of his wrath. How can God love us and be angry with us at the same time? Bless your heart. You must not have kids. Because if you had kids, you understand that love and wrath can very well coexist. In fact, any therapist will tell you that anger is actually an indicator light of what you care about deeply. The worst thing God could ever be towards you isn't angry, it's indifferent. But God, verse 4, if I was in a chocolate church, cue the Hammond B3 organ. But God, being not just merciful, but being rich in mercy, I love that. One preacher says, God has more mercy than we have mess. God's mercy account will never come back showing insufficient funds. God is rich in mercy. And then twice he says, for by grace you have been saved. Now let me quote one of your your pastors here, Matt Chandler. I love what he says about grace. He says, grace means you didn't eat your dinner, but you still get dessert. It's God's unmerited favor. It's it's what you didn't earn. C.S. Lewis uh, walked into a conversation of a group of people who are bantering about what is the difference between Christianity and other world religions. And C.S. Lewis says, that's easy. It's grace. It's grace. God, God is rich in mercy and he has, Paul says, immeasurable grace. We are not saved by our consecutive quiet time streak. We are not saved by our giving report. We are not saved by what church we attend. We are saved by grace through faith. faith. In fact, the Bible even says that on our best days, our righteousness is still as filthy rags. Friday nights in my house is game night. And one of my favorite games to play with our family is Monopoly. And nothing gives me greater joy than to bankrupt my family. I just absolutely love it. Just most beautiful sight in the world. At the end of the the game, I've got all the houses. I've got all the condominiums. I've got all the money. My kids ain't got nothing, which is kind of true now in real life. But anyways, you know what I do at the end of uh, Monopoly? What I never do is I never take that money and go to Bank of America to try to make a deposit. Because while Monopoly money has value within the realm or kingdom of Monopoly, it carries no value within the kingdom of this world. Friends, that's your righteousness apart from Christ. Your church attendance, your moral strivings, the letters behind your name, your zip code, that might carry value in the kingdom of this world. But outside of the righteousness of Christ, it's Monopoly money when it comes to the kingdom of heaven. We are saved by grace through faith. I I graduated from Talbot School of Theology, and when I went there, I told you I was was Poe. I I wish I could tell you I got a merit-based scholarship. I just kind of skated by in Bible college, but I got my whole seminary degree paid for because my seminary was wrestling with the fact that at one time they didn't allow people of color to join. 
And so to make up for it, um, they decided to set aside money some years later for people of color to get a certain kind of scholarship, the scholarship for under-resourced and represented students. Again, I didn't get a merit-based scholarship. I didn't graduate from college summa cum laude or magna cum laude. I graduated thank you laude. Just kind of skated through. So I get, to, I get to Talbot and I get this scholarship for something I had no control over, the color of my skin. There's no boasting in that. The boasting is I got a 4.0 in undergrad and that got me the merit-based scholarship and if I can keep up the academic performance then that's kind of how I graduate. That's where the boasting is. And if some of you are irritated and you would say, it's unfair that you would get that kind of scholarship, need I remind you, Paul is saying in so many words in the kingdom of heaven, there are no merit-based scholarship. We got in by grace and we're kept in by grace. I could talk about this all night. And chances are, if you've spent any time in the church, you've heard many sermons on Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 are all about vertical reconciliation. But for most conservative evangelical churches, they act as if all of Ephesians 2 is just 10 verses. But if you keep on reading, Paul actually does something astounding. Right on the heels of saying that, man, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God being rich in mercy, for by grace we have been saved, he now says in verse 11, therefore. Now, you don't need to spend a day in seminary to figure this out. Therefore simply means that what I'm about to say is connected to what I just said. In other words, for many of our Bibles, there's like a, a little division between verses 10 and 11 that some editor put some kind of a little heading in to try to give you some organization. It's actually not helpful because while the words of Scripture are inspired, the editor's little headings are not. And it makes it seem like these are two disjointed thoughts. They are not. Paul, right on the heels of talking about vertical reconciliation, now talks about what the gospel should do to us horizontally. He says, therefore now, you Gentiles, watch it, in the flesh. That phrase, in the flesh, means he's now talking about ethnicity. Paul is now going to show us that the gospel should press into how we think about and relate to people who don't look like us, act like us, think like us, or vote like us. The gospel is both vertical and horizontal. Now, this is all over your Bible. The Ten Commandments show us this paradigm of vertical and horizontal. The, the first category, the first several commandments, they're all vertical. How I relate to God, I shall have no other gods before you. The second set of commandments are all horizontal. It's how I relate to others. Jesus was once asked, what's the great commandment? He says, that's easy. It's to love the Lord your God with the totality of your being vertical. And the second is like it. It's to love your neighbor as yourself horizontal. John says it this way in 1 John 4, how can I claim to love God whom I don't see vertical while I hate my brother whom I do see? Scholar Ray Vanderlyn says that the Jewish concept of hate is not feelings of ill will. It is the idea of separation. That's why in Matthew 10, Jesus says, unless you're willing to hate your mother, father, sister, and brother, you're not worthy of me. He's not calling us to feelings of ill will. He's calling us to be able and be willing to separate from them for the sake of him. Hate is separation. John is saying it is incompatible with the gospel to say I've been vertically reconciled and yet live disconnected from my brothers and sisters who are ethnically different but equally made in the Imago Dei. That does not go together. So the gospel is just filled with, it is incompatible to say that I love Jesus, but I am at odds horizontally with other people. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says, pretty much says, an unforgiving Christian is an oxymoron. He pretty much says, if I don't care what you say about your relationship with me, if you are nursing a grudge, if you are carrying unforgiveness towards others, you go to hell. He's not saying forgive to get into heaven. He's saying the way that you know that heaven has gotten into you is you forgive. 
Luke chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says a greedy Christian is an oxymoron. He's not saying be generous to get into heaven, but he is saying the way that you know heaven has gotten into you is you're generous. And in our text, Galatians 2 and other passages, Jesus is saying a racist Christian is an oxymoron. How can you claim to know God as your father but hate your brothers and sisters because of their ethnicity? This is a gospel issue. So Paul, why are you passionate about this? You just think of Paul, Romans 1.16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to those that believe, not to the Jew only, but to the Jew first and also the Greek. And you just kind of follow Paul and his church planting strategy. Whenever Paul walks into a town in the book of Acts, he's got two questions. Where's the synagogue? I, I want to preach Christ to the Jews. I want to see Jews come to know Jesus. And that's what he does in Athens in Acts 17 and Corinth in Acts 18 and Ephesus in Acts 19. But he's not done. He then says, where do the Gentiles mean? Because I want to share Christ with them. Paul is compelled with gospel greed. He doesn't want to just see part of the city come to Christ. He wants to see the whole city come to Christ. And whatever he must do to do that, that's what he'll do. That's why he says in 1 Corinthians 9, to the Jew I became a Jew. To those outside the law, which are Gentiles, I became as one outside the law. Why do you do that, Paul? He ends by saying, I do it all, not because it's the sociological end thing to do, not because it's politically correct. I do it all for the sake of the gospel. If you are a gospel person, the gospel should compel you Not to just hop on a plane and share your faith to those poor, different-looking people over there, but to do it in your own town. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why, Paul, are you passionate? Because in our text, he says, I'll conclude with these two thoughts, that the death of Jesus Christ has dismantled the dividing wall of hostility. Oh, here's Paul. He uses Jewish imagery. He's referring to the temple. The temple had four courts. The outermost court was the court of the Gentiles. The next court was the court of the women. The next court was the court of the Israelites. And the final court was the court of the priests. The court of the Gentiles, as it sounds, was the only place where Gentiles can worship. By the way, I think in Matthew 21, when Jesus cleanses the temple, where is he? He's in the court of the Gentiles. What is he reacting to? Yes, the commercialization that was taking place there. And these Jewish leaders had set up their tables and they were just selling their wares in the only place that Gentiles can worship, which I believe Jesus is not just reacting to the commercialization of the temple. He is also pushing against a subtle and insidious form of racism where these Jewish leaders said, we can sell our wares where the Gentiles could worship because it's almost as if they're saying, They shouldn't be here anyways. Lest you think I'm chasing a bad idea, notice what Jesus says. He quotes from Jeremiah right there in the court of the Gentiles. He says, my house should be called a house of prayer for all nations. And there was a partition separating the court of the Gentiles from the other courts. They found it in the late 1800s. On it were words written to this effect, proceed no further upon fear of death. Do you know why Paul goes to jail for the last time? He is falsely accused of taking his dear Greek friend Trophimus into the forbidden parts of the kingdom. Now Paul says in Ephesians 2, the death of Jesus Christ, the cross of Jesus Christ serves as a sledgehammer, totally dismantling the dividing wall of hostility. The imagery is poignant. Now Jews and Gentiles can rush in together as one family and worship together. And yet when you look at a survey of the American church, we get an A plus for resurrection Correcting what Christ has already torn down, the dividing wall of hostility. I believe segregation today is worse than segregation in Jim Crow because today's segregation is voluntary. 
We like being segregated from each other. I'm not saying every church should be multi-ethnic. I think every church should reflect its community. But the typical community is multi-ethnic now. What do we do on Sunday mornings? We willingly go to our own homogenous spaces. Dr. Corey Edwards says that the homogenous church actually entrenches racism and bias. Why? We are all filled with our own prejudices, our own biases, and when you only do life with people who see it the way that you do, your biases never get challenged. So as a matter of your own spiritual formation, health, and growth, you need people who see it differently. That's why marriage is a means of grace. My wife and I are different. Different theologies on the toilet seat. Different theologies on the toothpaste. <laughs> different ways of approaching things. And yet 22 years in marriage, I can say I am a much better person for doing life with someone who's different. Why did he do all this in our last three minutes together? To form in himself, here it is, one new man. Last thought. Paul is writing in Greek, and Greek is very nuanced language. Several Greek words for new. One Greek word for new is neos, N-E-O-S. Neos speaks of something that is new as it relates to time. Um, it's the latest MacBook Pro. It's uh, the 2021 Chevy Tahoe. It's, um, it's the latest jet, airplane jet, to come off the assembly line. That's neos. Paul doesn't use neos. He uses the word for new, kainos. K-A-I-N-O-S. Kainos does not speak of something new as it relates to time. It speaks of something new as it relates to kind. It is the idea of invention. It is something so new you don't have a category for. Neos is the latest MacBook Pro. Kynos is the first computer. Neos is the 2021 Chevy Tahoe. Kynos is Henry Ford's Model T. Neos is the latest jet to come off the assembly line. Kynos is standing on Kitty Hawk Beach in the early 1900s and watching these two crazy brothers, the Wright brothers, up in the air, can you imagine coming home and your friend goes, tell me, what was it like? You have no words to describe it. You've never seen it before. Mind blown. That is the word Paul uses for the multi-ethnic church. The coming together of Jews and Gentiles. There was nowhere else in the world where you could see Jews and Gentiles coming together in meaningful meaningful, substantive koinonia fellowship, but the church of Jesus Christ. So when you walked into the church of Ephesus, the church at Corinth, the church at Athens, mind blown. We ain't blowing people's minds today. Of course that's the Fox News church. Of course that's the MSNBC church. Of course that's the CNN church. Of course, that's the Korean church. Of course, that's the Mexican church. Of course, that's the white church. Of course. But here's the deal. If people are still coming to church out of relationships, then sanctuaries reflect dinner tables. If you want a sanctuary that blows people's minds, is your dinner table blowing people's mind? So, Father, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you, Lord God, that the death of Jesus Christ dismantled, obliterated the dividing wall of hostility. So now we can rush in, not out of some political ideology, but we can rush in because that's what the gospel does. So show us, Lord God, press into us. 
to our own relationships, our own dinner tables, our own ministries, our own organizations of how we can better reflect the future eternal reality. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Amen. Brian, go ahead and have a seat right here. All right. Wow. Man, that was fire, wasn't it? Um, now we get to the good stuff, though. Now we, uh, I mean, not that, was, not, not that was good, but this is going to be even better. Um, and what we're going to do is take some uh, questions that we've already got some coming in. So my phone's going to start blowing up here in a second. Um, this first one, I'll, I'll frame this one a bit. Um, so when um, Michael Brown was shot in 2014, uh, hashtag Black Lives Matter started, right? And I remember at the time, um, I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to enter in. It's a little dangerous, right? And, um, and this was before it was a website, before it was a, a movement. Now CRT is all the, right, all the rage. Um, and, and I remember thinking, okay, I'm going to hashtag Black Lives Matter. And I remember thinking then, um, and I know what I'm going to get. I know what the response is going to be from my white friends. And it came. Jeff, all lives matter. All lives matter. How do you, how do you answer that? Yeah, I, I, think, um, I, I, I think that response lacks empathy. Mm. Right? Um, so one of the things I, I, I try to coach people in there's a helpful paradigm called the communication pyramid, um, which pretty much says, this is the most important thing I can tell you tonight, by the way, uh, from a practical perspective, which pretty much says there's five levels of communication. The most surface level is cliche. Good morning, good morning, how are you? You know, down south, we're just so nice. Mm. Um, you've communicated, but you haven't communicated. Levels two and level three, it's where most guys hang out, sports center talk. Uh, level two is facts sharing what you know. Uh, who won the game last night? I mean, did you see uh, LeBron James and the Lakers lose again? Um, you know, level three is opinion, sharing what you think. You think Cowboys will make this, the uh, Super Bowl? Yes. Oh, wow. Stephen A would say no. Uh, you know, it's just kind of sharing Stephen your opinions. Um, levels four and five are indicator lights of your deepest relationships. Let you know how your marriage is doing, how your friendships are doing. Because level four is emotive. It's sharing how I feel. Level five is transparency. It's sharing who you are. So what typically happens, uh, Jeff, is a racially traumatic event happens. People, communities of color, specifically black and brown communities of color, we're typically communal. Right, so when Michael Brown happens, you just kind of name it, we collectively across the nation feel that. We immediately go level four. Typically our white brothers and sisters, and I'm painting with a broad stroke, typically our white brothers and sisters, you don't see yourself communally. You see yourself more as a collection of individuals. Mm -hmm. I, I attach no moral value to that. And you typically go level two, facts. Right. Right. Give, me, give me the fact. Wait on the facts. Wait on the facts. Here, yeah. Now, if I come level four to my wife, or my wife comes level four to me, let's say it that way, and I hang out in lawyer land, we don't know the facts. 22 years of marriage tells me that's not going to play well. No, no, no. No. <laughs> if I want oneness with my bride, let me first stop and feel. Yeah. Let me go level four. It's what the Bible calls grieve with those who grieve. Yeah, yeah. Now, is there a place for facts? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so what you're doing in that moment, Black Lives Matter, you're expressing empathy. Mm -hmm. You're going, let, let me just meet you yep. at level four. Yep. When a person comes back, all lives matter. Is that true? Is that a true statement? Mm -hmm. Yes. But it's an incredibly ill-timed statement that lacks empathy. So let me first stop and feel until we may need to resurface later for facts. Yeah. It's just called being a good human being. It's good. So instead of reacting, a, a black man, for instance, a black man's been shot and killed. That's not always the first response from 
a white person, perhaps, it's not, right? It's not. Yeah, yeah so we, we need, you know, uh, Sung Chan Ra wrote a great book some years ago called Prophetic Lament. And one of the things he argues in this book is um, he looks at all of our worship songs. He says most of our worship songs are triumphalistic. He has overcome. He has risen. He'll return. Wonderful truths, but he says less than 5% of our songs are lament songs. So we are, we are forming a culture of people who just don't know how to sit in the ashes with mm -hmm. people and weep to have ministry of presence and to just sit there. That, that was the hardest thing for me to do as a new pastor, by the way. Take the race thing away. Hospital visitations, I felt like I, I've got a 30-minute window to fix something. Mm -hmm. When really all they want from me is to just sit there and show some empathy. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay, so, um, gosh, there's several good, good questions here. Um, and we're going to go there. We're going to go. Um, so, trigger words, uh, white privilege. Um, I know when I've, when I've talked about that, you know, people are like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I've, I've worked hard. You know, what are you talking about privilege? How would you explain that to Okay, to uh, white let, me, let me aggravate you. Um, Come on. <laughs> Let's go. So, let me frame it this way. Um, in my work as a pastor in this area, I'm a reconciler, not an, not an activist. Okay, play that out, parse that out. What's the difference? There's, there's a difference. We need activists. Activists tend to be concerned with the issue. They care about the what. Reconcilers tend to be concerned about the person. We care about the how. See? A reconciler, yeah, let's talk about reparations, wherever you, wherever you may fall out on that. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about police brutality. But I don't want to just solve the issue. I want a relationship with you. Mm. When that's my posture, I'm concerned now about my language. So can I deal with a true concept and keep you engaged at the table? Mm -hmm. I don't like the phrase white privilege. This is the aggravating part. The reason, look, is white privilege, is the concept a real thing? Absolutely. I don't like the phrase because it seems to demonize privilege for the sake of privilege. I talk about this in my book, um, Insider Outside, uh, Outsider. Privilege is not inherently evil. All of us in this room has a measure of privilege. My parents just celebrated 50 years of marriage. Wow. Gr grown up in a home, two parents who love each other, who love Jesus. That is a measure of privilege. Mm -hmm. If privilege in and of itself was wrong, then Jesus was wrong. Mm. No one came to earth more privileged than Jesus. That's Philippians chapter 2. Though he was born in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, I'm not letting you off the hook. The issue is not privilege, it's the stewardship of privilege. Do we still live in a society that is weighted towards our white brothers and sisters? I think absolutely yes. Is it wrong to be white? Absolutely not. But you are born with a measure of privilege. The question is, what are you doing with it? Tim Keller says in his book, Generous Justice, that righteousness is disadvantaging yourself uh, to the advantage of others. He says wickedness is advantaging yourself to the disadvantage of others. So if you are a white individual who lives in a society that is still weighted towards whites and you are not looking for ways to be able to steward your privilege in a way that lifts others up, then I would say you're missing the message of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. What can a, what can a and we're not all, all white here, but we, we're pretty white. Um, <laughs> white. What can a white affluent church do? Um, you know, how would you guide a white church? You're in a predominantly white church, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. what, can a, what can a privileged church, okay, do to, to truly help? In regard, when you know, when people want to fight against reparations, or, are you kidding me? That's like, you know, how do you how do you go about that? 
play that out for us. Reparations up against maybe restitution, yeah. biblically? Yeah. How it, does it, that look, happen? It's, it's hard to make a biblical case for reparations. Um, I think you can make a constitutional case. You know, if you just look at the, the um, field order. We've seen order, that yeah. in, in our history, right? Yeah, yeah. The 40 acres and a mule thing was, was a start towards that, and then it stopped, right? Uh, Andrew Johnson, okay. uh, president who, who comes in, he totally, he totally reverses that, things that nature. So that was right after the Civil War. Right, right, right after the Civil War, that stops. But the, na- the country did that with the Japanese who were put in the internment camps, over a billion that? dollars given to them, yep. um, reparations, Native Americans. Native Americans. So I think you can make historical constitutional things. But here's the deal. In, in, in Luke chapter 18, chapter 19, I always get, get them confused when Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' home. <laughs> Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector, which means he has designed a system of injustice. So when people want to talk about, you know, t- talk about, about you know, systemic sin, it's the story of Zacchaeus. You just heard it through the lens of Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's also a story of systemic structural injustice. What happens? Jesus shows up at his house. At no point does Jesus go, hey, Zacchaeus, you've defrauded people. Let's talk about making it right. What happens is the Spirit of God invades Zacchaeus' heart. He goes, you know what? I've wronged a lot of people. Uh, up, to, up to half my goods I'm going to give to the poor, and if I've defrauded anybody, I'll restore it to them fourfold. Jesus says, today salvation has come to your heart and life. It's just a response to what the Spirit of God. So as far as solutions go, uh, I've, I've got a couple of friends of mine, uh, white, wealthy businessmen, who approached me and some other black pastors right on the heels of George Floyd. They're going, listen, man, we've been blessed financially. We've decided to put a fund together of our own resources, and we're inviting some other white individuals to contribute. Um, Can you, this board of black pastors, advise us Uh on some ways to allocate allocate these resources? Mm -hmm. Um, and so we've advised them towards educational opportunities, um, training up entrepreneurs in certain minority communities. But this wasn't legislated. It's just spirit of God, you know, just saying, listen, uh, I've got enough jet skis. There's, yeah. there's a problem out there. How can I do that? I think that's, that's very biblical, that's good. solutions-oriented. That's good, so. Brian. So here's one. Um, Black uh, BLM as a hashtag versus BLM as an organization foundation? Question mark. Let's go. There. Yeah. So um, l- let me just say this. Uh, w- one of the things I think we, we got to talk about is, you know, that whole statistic of eighty-one percent of white evangelicals voting for Trump in the twenty sixteen election. Uh, obviously, we've got to be careful of that statistic. Many of my white evangelical friends who voted for Trump, it wasn't that they liked Trump. They voted for party over person. Now, here's why this relates to what you're asking. Many white evangelicals were able to have nuance and parse out in their voting decision uh, party versus person, right? Mm -hmm. So many of them, I'm not going to say most or all, many of them said, eh, not a big fan of him, but he stands for my values. At least he appears that way. But then when we come to Black Lives Matter, they don't want to give us the ability to parse out in nuance Black Lives Matter, the organization, mm-hmm. from Black Lives Matter, the sentiment. Right. That's got to be a two-way street. Yep. And they have not made it that way. Yep. And so, listen, I, I tell my African-American friends, if you're in the black community, you should be at the front of the line being incensed by what Black Lives Matter, the organization, stands for. Mm -hmm. On their website, they have a stated aim to disintegrate the nuclear family. Yeah. Yep. It doesn't doesn't get any more egregious than that. Um, So that is reprehensible. It should be rejected. But Black Lives Matter, the sentiment? Right. 
I'm for that all day. Yeah. In fact, we can't genuinely say all lives matter until, until black lives matter. Right. Right. That's good. Man, that's good. Y'all got some good questions too. Um, let's keep rolling. Um, okay, here's a good one. Um, it's almost like social justice has become a curse word. So how, parse out for us, maybe it's social justice versus biblical justice. Yeah, there's a great book on this written by uh, Dr. Thaddeus Williams. He's a professor at Biola University. Just Google his name. It, the, the, the title's a little clunky. He has a good paradigm uh, that differentiates between what he calls social justice A versus social justice B. I mean, I just, I just hate it, right? The, the, the etymological principle is words evolve over time. And now justice has been kind of seen in the eyes of many as being co-opted by our friends on the left. And there's this whole kind of political ideology that infuses it. Where I just want to go read your Bible, justice, the word and the concept, it's biblical. Like there are over 2,350 verses in the Bible, Randy Alcorn says, that talks about God's heart for the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the immigrant over 2,350 verses, mm. and God's huge heart in engaging them. I mean, Matthew 25, the last sermon Jesus preaches prior to the cross. Whatever you've done to the least of these, wow. you've yeah. done it also unto me. You just look at the arc of church history. I mean, I'm glad William Wilberforce didn't buy into this whole social justice is evil, so just kind of do your job and wow. stay out of that other stuff. Mm -hmm. It's because of him and the Clapham sect that they take down slavery. I mean, it was white evangelicals in England at the front of the line saying, we, we ain't got time to be talking about critical race theory. I mean, you guys understand it wasn't a big thing back then, mm -hmm. but we've got to deal with this, right? Um, man, I'm thankful the civil rights movement I mean, these were, it was a church-led movement where they would genuinely meet in a church before they took to the streets. What I lament is this movement has left the church, and I don't know if it's ever coming back. Mm -hmm. So, so while, we are, we, while we are debating over critical race theory and social justice and all this other stuff, literally, Black Lives Matter movement has taken our place. And we're debating critical race theory. So that's the big difference. The civil rights movement was born out of the church, Dr. Yes. King and others, driven by the gospel. Yes. This is not. This is not. Right. This yeah. is not. So I think if we can just have a biblical vision of justice, you know, so Charlie Dates is just masterful at parsing this out. If you mm -hmm. look at the, the actual Hebrew words in the Old Testament, oftentimes justice and righteousness show up in the same. same passage. And it's that whole vertical, horizontal thing. Mm -hmm. Righteousness is my vertical standing before God. Justice is how I flesh that out horizontally towards others. And those two things are linked. The problem with liberals is they have justice without righteousness. And the problem with conservatives, historically, is they have righteousness without justice. Wow, wow. So tell me this, why... Theologically, this seems to have played out historically. Why does the white church, why has, again, I'm making a broad statement here. Why does primarily the white conservative, white church, biblically conservative white church, why has it truncated the gospel to really, what happened there theologically? We often talk about, and that's just a vertical. I've, heard, I've had people tell me, Jeff, just preach the gospel, right? Meaning, just and all this other, you don't, just, we need to get people to heaven and because that seems to be the mindset. Now, right. is that true? Is it true in the black church or is it not? Is that a white thing? Yeah, so listen, I, the, the, the line of demarcation uh, is a fundamentalist modernist controversy of the earlier part of the 20th century, mm -hmm. right? Where there was this great divorce in the church. And so you had the fundamentalist father who pretty much said, listen, man, the gospel is just vertical. Um, out of that, you, you kind of have all the birth of all these Bible colleges, Christian camps, just learn truth, learn truth, learn truth, learn truth. Then you had the modernists who said, no, 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 the gospel's horizontal. It's, it's how I relate to how I treat others. I remember being in, in seminary 
and even the social gospel movement yes. was a, that was a liberal thing. Absolutely, right? absolutely. So we have it. Now, truth of the matter is there was already rumblings uh, with that. If you read Mark Knowles, the theological, the, the Civil War as Theological Crisis, he just talks about how slave owners and abolitionists could read the same Bible but come out with two radically different operating mm -hmm. systems. So even that predates the fundamentalist modernist controversy. But I believe it's that fundamentalist modernist controversy that now breeds where we are now. And so as you mentioned, the white moderate, obviously that's the fundamentalist stream. And that's where, listen, I'm, I'm, I'll lose most of you with this, with this um saying here. Come on, Brian. You already got us, bro. But no, let's go. Dispensationalism was a horrible thing. Classic dispensation. I'm not talking progressive. Classic dispensationalism pretty much said, man, let's just deal with the heart. Let's just get them saved. Let's just deal with the soul. Um, and it's a thing that comes up in the 19th century that flourishes among middle class whites. But when you have to trust God for a bus pass, mm. when, when you don't know when your next meal is going to come, you want a little bit of the kingdom now, mm -hmm. right? Um, George Whitfield, J.D. JD and I mm. had a conversation about George Whitfield the other day. I don't think George Whitfield should ever be quoted by any Christian. Because George Whitfield, Georgia did not legalize slavery initially. George Whitfield was looking to fund his orphanage, and he wanted to use the plantation system, but it was illegal. Slavery was in Georgia. He lobbied for years, and it was because of the lobbying of George Whitfield wow. that Georgia legalized slavery, and yet we would say he's an evangelical. Now, George Whitfield justified it because he was one of the only few whites back then to preach to slaves. He believed they had a soul, but their body didn't matter. That is the modernist spirit. Which is why slavery survives the Great Awakening. That's a whole nother thing. I mean, was the Great Awakening a genuine revival? I believe it was. Should it have continued longer? Yes. Why didn't it? I think we'll get to heaven here. God say, I was waiting for you to deal with slavery. And slavery quenched the Holy Spirit. And that revival should have lasted a lot longer. Wow. Uh, how about this? Some of these I'm going I'm to read straight up um, and cold. I we'll hope they're good. I think y'all got some good questions. How important is explaining historical context? We talked about this a little bit from a different experience for people that may not be outwardly racist, but are blind to past and current bias. Example, slavery was over 150 years ago, and we are in the 21st century where I never owned a slave, nor participated in Jim Crow, nor was against civil rights. You know, it's that the story. This is like, this is now. That was then. Yeah, so I, I, I think historical context is necessary. It's sort of like, um, the way I like to explain it is, you know, my great-great-grandfather was a slave uh, in Asheville, North Carolina, uh, and let's say a white person's great-great-grandfather was a slave owner, and my great-great-grandfather sit down to play a game of Monopoly. And my great-great-grandfather passes go. Uh, the great-great-grandfather of the white person punches him in the mouth, uh, says, you're not getting your $200, you can't buy property. That's how that game is played for generations. Then my grandfather sits down with the white uh, person's grandfather. My grandfather passes go. The white person's grandfather says, you know what? Um, listen, uh, what my grandfather did was horrible. You can get your 200 bucks. I'll even let you buy property, but you can only buy the light blue and the purple. Don't even think about Park, Park Place, Place or Boardwalk. That is completely off. That's how the game is played for generations. And now you and I sit down and you say, hey man, all that stuff was in the past. W what's the problem? The problem is, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying the average white person is wealthy. I am saying that that wealth gap is here. Mm -hmm. And we still feel the effects of that. And we've got to do something to close the gaps on that. By the way, that's why critical race theory, which is problematic, hear me say that. But what critical race theory was trying to do in the early to mid-70s as it's in its infancy, 
is say, listen, we've made all these legislative gains for civil rights. We're not feeling the impacts of that in our community. So it starts in the legal realm to say, you made promises, we've got to hold your feet to the fire. The church wasn't doing that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you've got to have that narrative in order to get people to see there are present day impacts of that. I can take you to another one. Um, you know, I pastored in Memphis for 12 years. Every single Christian school in Memphis, like most Southern towns, was started as an alternative to Brown versus Board of Education. Mm. I mean, private schools were response to. We call that systemic injustice. So what white, Christian, uh, white, what white Christians did in Memphis is, no way our kids are going to the same school as your kids. It's illegal for us to start new public schools just for us. We'll start private schools and price you out. See? So yeah. th there's this, so there, now there's, there's some education gaps that have happened. What do we do with that? These are realities. Not to induce guilt, but how were they able to pay for these new Christian schools unless there was a bit of a wealth gap, which came on the backs of free labor known as slaves? Mm -hmm. Wow. What about the, talk to us about the wealth, the wealth gap here in America. Yeah, the wealth gap really hasn't gotten better. See, listen. Uh, I'll put my cards on the table. I'm a registered independent. I'm not a big fan of partisan politics. Mm. Um, what I want to talk to black people about, look, you vote who you want to. Uh, you be associated with whatever party you want to uh, be associated with. We, as black people, we have to stop lying to ourselves. Um, Malcolm X said it back in the 1950s. He says, the white liberal, don't buy the lie, the white liberal doesn't really care about us. Now, I just, I just want to say this. If you just look at cities run by Democrats, mm. hasn't gotten better. I, 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 if you go to San Francisco, I lived in the Bay Area, the homeless crisis, they have tent cities of homeless people. They tear down projects yep. in San Francisco. You look at the violence in Chicago, so on and so forth. I'm not saying Republicans are better than Democrats or Democrats are better than Republicans. I'm just saying, if you're putting your hope ultimately in the Democratic basket to be our savior, they've had a good run, and it just hasn't gotten better. How has it gotten better? It hasn't gotten better. So we have to reimagine new ways for us to engage in this. And this is why I want to loop around and close off. You, you asked about the black church. The black church did not have, did not have the um, flexibility. No, that, that's, that's the wrong word. Um, the black church couldn't sit back and argue about vertical and horizontal. Mm -hmm. we, we, had to be, mm -hmm. we had to be our own adoption agency. We, we had to take care of our own. Um, we had our own doctors. I mean, my, my grandfather used to always say, and it was a, it's kind of a messed up saying. He goes, you know what? Well, you know what I loved about segregation? Not that he was wishing to go back. He goes, we cared about our community. We, ap we absolutely care about. So we couldn't, yeah. we couldn't just trust the government to do so. We had to jump in and care for our own. And, and the church, the black church, was right at the heart of that. Yeah. It was right at the heart of that. Now, the problem is, well, I won't even deal with that. So, yeah. So, I, ha, I've heard, uh, I think it was Tim Keller was talking about, I'm going to piggyback on that real quick, and I'll get back to some questions. Um, he was talking about the black church. Here's a white man talking about the black church. Um, smart white man talking Very about smart. the black church. But he said he wasn't so sure that the black church, he didn't know if, if integration, if you will, or... Um, Diversity of, in the black, he thinks it could do, do damage in the black church because it's such the community hub. And he, he was noting that, I'm putting words in his mouth, but he was, I was surprised by his, by his answer. He was being thoughtful, like, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's, that's good for the black church. Or I think when I'm, you know, every black member, person of color who joins our church, I just, I just want to, you know, 
go up and just, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're a better church because of you. We're going to be better. We're, we're, you know, we're going to see the kingdom show up because of you. This is amazing. Um, I mean, what's your thought about that? You, you noted earlier that the, the, the church should reflect the community. And yet, yes, within driving distance, we're very diverse here, even in even here. Yeah. So if you read Isabel Wilkins's book, The Warmth of Other Sons, one of the things she mm. talks about, and, and my father was weeping as we discussed it, is she deals with the great migration of which my grandparents were part of. Uh, they were in North Carolina, Conover, um, mm -hmm. I think in the 1930s, they migrated up to uh, New, New Jersey. What was typical of black churches during the Great Migration is they would have these auxiliaries formed around southern states where people came from. So if you're a black church in Chicago or in a northern city, and imagine you just got there from Mississippi or North Carolina, there's a sense of disequilibrium. Mm -hmm. Well, now there's a whole ministry that's the North Carolina ministry or the, or the Mississippi ministry where immediately you're connected with people who come from where you come from. They can point you in the direction of jobs wow. and housing. You mean in the north, in the northeast? In, in, in the north where these churches were yeah, in yeah. the north, Wow. right? So listen, I, I think there's going to always be a place for that, especially for immigrant communities as well. You know, again, you've got a sense of disequilibrium. I think a homogenous church is very helpful there. Here's the problem with Keller's argument, which I believe, I gotta be careful how I say this because it's being recorded. I think Keller unwittingly has facilitated the problem. Hmm. Keller's big emphasis on the city, right? Get to the city, cities are where it's happening. Cities are, mm -hmm. I think there's a whole generation of church planters who bought into that and modern day church planting facilitates gentrification. Okay. Right? So what you have now is what used to be black communities, urban communities are now being gentrified. Mm -hmm. Church plants are coming in. Uh, and instead of going, you know what? There's some great seasoned pastors who've been here for decades. Let me sit under them. Let me learn under them. They just start their own thing, mm -hmm. target towards their their new gentrifying audience. Wow. And now the black church is in this awkward space of, do I stay here and die? What do I do? Where do I go? In cities, this is a real problem. So I don't, I don't think it's as cut and dry as Keller's making it seem because what he's ignoring is gentrification. New York City today is drastically different than what it was in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. Right. So is Oakland. So is San Francisco. So on and so forth. So, um, I'll say this last thing. Dr. Corey Edwards, Jesus-loving assistant professor of sociology at the Ohio State University. So <laughs> annoying. Um, <laughs> she says that the average community that a church sits in is ten times more diverse than the church. Oh wow! And yeah. the average schools in the community that a church sits in is twenty times more diverse than the church. So, so the multi-ethnic church which has tripled since 1998. 1998, 7% of all churches were multi-ethnic. Mm -hmm. Now, in evangelical spaces, mm -hmm. now it's 22%. It is a reflection of a world that is becoming more and more diverse. Yeah. Right? Gen Z, I, the most diverse generation Absolutely. I ever. love the black church, grew up in the black church. My pastor, pastor's in Inglewood, and he's having a hard time because the Rams have built their new stadium there. Um, he says white people are moving here three on a mule, not literally. Um, <laughs> and so it's just changing. What does he do? Mm -hmm. I wow. think this is a question most black churches in cities are wrestling with. So let's, let's hang here for just a moment um, because we've got some church planners here. Uh, you're, you're the founder, uh, director, don't know exactly what your title is, uh, of Kainos. Uh, ministry, church planning, and yep. you do that at your yep. church now. Um, do a lot of consulting work there. Yep. So we got some church planners here. Uh, you met Dr. Kelly Hamilton on our staff who's leading our church uh, pastoral center. Um, so how might you instruct or guide, I know you do whole seminars on this, how would you lead church planners, and even, even some of us here who want to be a part of that movement, um, shall we start from, from the start, you know, should it be a multi-ethnic church? I guess it depends on the where it's planted. We are now, you'll be excited about this. We 
we're now planting with Concord, coming around uh, Marlon McGuire, a guy that went through our program here, launching a church in January. Our two churches are coming together. And it's going to be multi-ethnic from the start. Love it. And that's his vision. That's his dream. I think some of the fastest growing churches in Dallas right now were started as multi-ethnic churches, not trying to do the hard work, which, you know, which is the hard work we must do. Right. What, how, would you, how would you guide that? Uh, number one, I would say to a church planner, it begins with place. Mm-hmm. Like God should break your heart for a place. You should have a burden for that place. And then you step back and you go, does this place lend itself towards that? Is a trajectory towards that? That is a huge question. So many church planters get in trouble because they take a photograph of a place, not, really, not realizing that that place is not a photograph, it's a movie. So what you need to be careful of, you, you, you got to be able to forecast five years out and just go, is my passion for the kind of church that I want to do, will this place lend itself towards that? I saw church planters crash and burn in Oakland. Because they came to Oakland to plant a urban church, not realizing that that's your grandfather's Buick. Mm -hmm. Oakland Mm -hmm. is gentrifying. It's changing. And so you get there thinking, I'm going to go after the younger African Americans. But the younger African Americans are leaving. So you got to do your homework. What has God burdened you for? And then now we can get to the X's and O's of it. You know, I tell church planters, there's a couple of uh, hires you need to put on a credit card if you have to. Uh, worship, having someone who can lead worship. Worship is a huge culture-making thing that sets the mm-hmm. environment that's conducive to multi-ethnicity. Mm-hmm. So you, gotta, you have to hire the right worship leader. And the right worship leader, I always, I always say, a great worship leader substantively, um, you know, it's going to always point me to the cross, point me to Jesus, I don't want a whole lot of personal pronouns. Let's exalt Christ. But stylistically, you know, if we're talking black-white context, which I'll use that language just to simplify, I would always tell my worship leaders, um, take a Hillsong song and put a little Lowry seasoning salt on it. Uh If you don't know Lowry's, never invite me to your house for dinner. Uh All right? Um, Spice it up a little bit. Um, Or you can take a Kirk Franklin, whatever, Mm -hmm. ease up on it. But here's Mm -hmm. the deal. A great worship leader in a multi-ethnic environment facilitates equitable discomfort. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If one group of people always leaves the worship experience going, they sang every song that I liked the way that I liked it, Mm -hmm. I have failed you. The message of Acts 15 is when it comes to the church of Jesus Christ, there is no ethnic home team. Mm. Wow. So when they're getting together and they've planted all these churches and now Judaizers are coming in and pretty much saying, in order to be Christian, you have to act Jewish. Mm -hmm. They huddle together, the leaders in Acts 15, and the verdict they render is you don't have to act Jewish in order to be saved. And the church of Jesus Christ, this ain't a Jewish thing. It ain't a Gentile thing. it's 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 a Jesus thing. And so when we talk about a multi-ethnic church, there can't be a home team ethnically. And that's a message the, the planter has got to constantly communicate. This ain't a Hispanic church. It's not a black church. We're going to do some things. We're going to exalt Christ, but we're going to do some things that will make you feel uncomfortable. And you have to set that DNA from jump. Your first three years as a church planter, you're pouring concrete. After about three years, that concrete's going to dry, and you're going to be who you are. So don't come in there doing a three-year study on the Gospel of Luke. Save that for later. Mm -hmm. Preach vision. Preach your core values. And one of those core values, if it's, hey, we're going to be a multi-ethnic church, you're going to have to really walk with your people on that. Teach it with patience. Teach it with love. Um, I encourage a teaching team uh, that served mm-hmm. us well at Fellowship Memphis. Mm-hmm. Uh, a multi-ethnic teaching team was just a great thing for us. Uh, and then location was, was huge for us as well. Uh, but ultimately, I'd say preach Jesus. You know, we, I mean, I would, um, I'd probably preach on race three or four times a year. It's kind of all, all we did. But when it's just a part of your DNA and they're hearing about it, the new members class and so other, so, so many, so other ways, there's other ways to, to cement it. So I think if you check those boxes, the teaching, the worship, 
it's a core value, the location. I think you're headed in the right direction. That's good. Well, we're gonna we'll get a couple more questions here. Um, so I'll frame this one this way. I, I've always I've always said empathy is the pathway to peace. Yes. However, there's a barrier prior to empathy. And we don't like to hear this word, but it's ignorance. How do we help? I'm speaking mostly of the white church. How do we guide people towards empathy to, to want to learn? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you straight up. Our team planning this event tonight, we said we're going to get the people who are, are kind of already in, primarily, right? Those who like, ah, no, nah, I'm, I'm good. I'm not a racist, right? Um, how, how do you, how could we all, not just pastor, how can we help guide people towards learning? It's a great question. So you've got three kinds of people in your church when it comes to this issue. The ready, the reluctant, the resistant. Mm -hmm. Three kinds of people. My gut tells me um, that the bookends are probably your lower percentages, right? You, you've got a smaller percentage, you're going to be ready. Let's go. Let's, let's do it. I'm coming here. I ain't never even heard of this guy, Brian, but I'm signed up at mm -hmm. it. You got other people, they're just going to resist. They're going to dig in and, you know, I'm not changing, whatever. But I think the bulk of people are reluctant. They won't necessarily come to an event like this. They won't necessarily sign up for something. They won't necessarily go to the class. But they're open, some more so than others. They're reluctant. Because of that, Colossians 1.28 is our friend. When Paul says, I labor to present everyone mature in Christ. It's a powerful word. The idea, Paul, is he says, pastoral leadership implies immaturity. I assume immaturity among people. Mm. And one of the ways I assume immaturity is racially. Yeah. America has formed us into prejudice racism, to, 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 to regard people according to the flesh. The work of the, fat, of the pastor is to deconstruct that. And we've got to have pastoral patience. We're pastors, yeah. not prophets right. when it comes to race. To walk with people. Prophets yeah. just hit you in the mouth. Here's truth. Get with it. You're bleeding. A pastor is not passive. We're patient. So we're going to walk with you. So that's my posture as a leader. Now, your posture is this, 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. How do I get out of ignorance and journey into empathy? 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. Paul says to the Jew, I became hmm. as a Jew. To those outside the law, which would be Gentiles, I became as one outside the law. One scholar says, the idea of I have become is the idea of empathy. It's the ability to put yourself in another person's skin to feel what mm -hmm. they feel. Now, notice how that happens. It doesn't happen by reading a book. Helpful. Insider, outsiders, wonderful idea. Wow, that's a good one. Right? It's a great so, book. It's, it's helpful, but the way you do that is via relationship. So that if you want to go from ignorance to empathy, let me look at your friends. Let me look at who you're doing life with. Let me say one more thing here. It's really important. I read a book, uh, Reggie Williams, a scholar out of Fuller, wrote a book called Bonhoeffer's Black Jesus. Hmm. It's his PhD dissertation. Mind-blowing. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, most of us know that name. One of the 20th century martyrs. Bonhoeffer, 21, he's a prodigy. Graduates with his PhD and then he comes to America to do a fellowship at Union uh, Seminary, which is part of Columbia, which is in Harlem in the 1930s. <laughs> Bonhoeffer is in Harlem in the 1930s. Bonhoeffer says, man, I, I thought I knew Jesus. In hindsight, I didn't, knew, didn't know Jesus, but because I thought I knew Jesus, I start looking for all these churches to go to. He goes, none of the white churches did it for me. So he joins the Abyssinian Baptist Church. Large black church still around today. Bonhoeffer from Germany. Wow. You weren't getting this. 1930s <laughs> joins a black church. For the choir, for the music. No, no. I'm sorry. Go ahead. He sorry. follows black leadership. Yeah. He submits to black leadership. Do you know that phrase, cheap grace? Mm-hmm. 
It's not original to him. He got it from his black pastor, Adam Clayton Powell. Wow, wow, wow. He teaches Sunday school at the black church. Befriends a guy named Albert. Albert says, hey, Dietrich, come on, go with me. Uh, we're going to take a train ride down to the Jim Crow South. He gets down there, blows his mind. Albert introduces him to Negro spirituals. Bonhoeffer falls in love, takes him back with him to his makeshift seminary. Yeah. Here's what Bonhoeffer says. I don't go back to Germany. I don't go back to Germany to stand up for the oppressed and marginalized until I first experience the gospel to the oppressed and marginalized at my black church in Harlem. What changed him? I have become. Yeah, yeah. Bonhoeffer was ignorant. Yeah. But he emerges empathetic because he was willing to be a minority. Yeah. See, I believe minorities have a leg up on whites in the area of ethnic unity mm -hmm. and empathy because the average minority who is successful by the world standards, by the world standards, we have to learn to relate to you. Right. That is not a two-way street. Yeah, yeah. So again, for the good of your own spiritual formation, wow. you need to be immersed in context in which you are the minority yeah. and you learn from people who see it differently. Yeah, that's good. Okay, two more questions and we'll wrap it up. Um, I'm gonna make this statement. I've often thought and challenged our people. It might be that some of you white people, maybe God's calling you to go and join a church Amen. that doesn't look like you at all. Amen. Right? Amen. And because then you're helping some other pastor, brother like me, you know, who wants us to be more diverse. Right? Amen. Um, so two, two questions. One, here's one. Your, your book talked about the importance of preparing a white congregation for a black preacher to preach authentically. Do you think this congregation is prepared, maybe on a scale one to ten, for a black preacher? I think that's the question. If this is your normal congregation, um, I'm just going to chalk it up to a lo long day at work. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. a lot of traffic. Yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll chalk that up. Okay. No, I'm, I'm, you know, that's, that's good. I'm always wanting a little more response on <laughs> Sunday morning. Okay, we'll wrap up with this one. And sorry, we, we had some good questions, um, but really good stuff tonight. Um, Here's, here's a really good question. As a pastor following the pandemic, what is your hope for the American church from your perspective when it comes to race, reaching the lost, or just how many Christians are no longer in church? You and I talked about this earlier a little bit, kind of the crazy time that we live in right now. What, what's your hope for, this is multi-level, for race and for post-pandemic? I gotta be honest, I'm, you know, the way I'm wired, I'm, I'm, I'm typically a pretty positive mm -hmm. uh, person, um, especially along these lines. And I've just, I've just been struggling. Um, you know, David Kinnaman, um, CEO of Barna Research, they're researching now the effects of the pandemic. Um, and a part of that research is on race relations. So, you know, when I talk about the multi-ethnic church and evangelical spaces, 7% in 1998, 22% now, I bet you that number has slid way back. Um, I think 2020 was just a perfect storm of you got a pandemic and quarantine life, so we're, li we're relationally disconnected. So my friend Eric Mason says proximity breeds empathy, mm -hmm. distance breeds suspicion. Wow, wow, wow. So when I'm not connected to you, I'm, I'm not going to give you the benefit of the doubt because I don't really know you, mm -hmm. right? So now I'm disconnected. And then what do we have? Racial trauma. Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Jacob Blake. And so now we've got trauma and we've got one group of people lamenting. We're separated from one another. Then what do we have? We've got Donald Trump in 2020. Right? And, yep. and the election that, that, that happens there. And then, well, then January 6th. January 6th. I'm in a meeting with the six Southern Baptist uh, seminary presidents trying to facilitate reconciliation wow. uh, between them and African-American leadership. And they go, hey, we should pause and pray because people are storming the Capitol. Wow. So it was just crazy, all this stuff happening. And, and my concern is... You know, I've just been thinking about Galatians 2. You know, you remember when Paul says, look, I had to oppose Peter to his face. 
because prior to certain Jews coming, he was mm-hmm. eating with the Gentiles, and these Jews st- uh, came by, and he just withdrew. Peter didn't, he didn't say anything inappropriate. He just didn't advocate. Mm. He was a coward. Wow. I think, I think that's one of the major problems with the church in 2020 was we have all this trauma going on, and we didn't have enough advocates. Wow. You know, when it comes to these issues, there's, there's three kinds of people. Critics, advocates, and bystanders. Mm-hmm. I mean, I look at you, Jeff, and I don't say this to flatter you. You're an advocate. Mm. You're an advocate. Um, and I, I want to encourage us. Let's be, let's be advocates for what the Bible says. Um, let's not be bystanders. Mm. Let, let's not be, let's not be, be critics. It, it bothers me to no end to hear people just... I mean, I got called a critical race theorist about 15 months ago. I didn't even know what that was. I said, I should probably read a couple books on this. But the people talking about it, they never talked about justice. Mm. Now they're talking more about cultural Marxism and critical race theory yeah, yeah. than they were yeah. justice. That's a problem. Yeah. That's a problem. So I think the gospel says, man, how can we advocate for one another? How can we love one another? 2020, I didn't see a whole lot... Like if my only exposure to the, if I'm an unbeliever and my only exposure to the people of God wow. was social media, wow. I would not become a believer. And if, you're, and if you're black and you attach evangelical Christianity to the, to the white population, like, no. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I don't, yeah, you know, I, just as I think, Justice has been politicized. I think evangelical has been politicized. I'm uncomfortable. I'm, I'm orthodox, mm-hmm. uh, but I'm uncomfortable with the term evangelical because it's just gone in a Man, direction that so, I'm just not comfortable so with. So much has been hijacked, yep. hasn't it? Yep. And even, but with all, we started with Black Lives Matter all the way to, you know, CRT, um, you've called it an unnecessary distraction. Because we don't want to focus on the main thing. That's right. Let's jump to this. That's right. In our echo chamber of, of certain, you know, news feeds or yep. whatever else, yep. don't help us at all. At and all. we need to be discipled out of that. That's right. Right? That's right. So um, we'll, we'll wrap up uh, with this. Um, I, want to be, I want to be an advocate, Brian. Yeah. When I, when, I look at, when I look at pictures of Dr. King marching in Selma, and I see that white brother standing there with him. He was often, right, he often had the collar on. He's some Anglican Catholic, right? I think that's the one who got killed. So I want to be that, I want to be that guy. I want, to be on, I want to be that guy. I want to be on the right side of history. Mm. And the question I'm asking, we asked it on Sunday, what story am I, am I going to tell? Mm-hmm. What's going to be the story that my kids and my grandkids are going to tell of decisions that I made? And that's true for every one of us. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. And, um, and I think, you know, tonight has been such a gift. You have been such a gift to us. And you're... You've been a gift to me. I've shared that with you privately, but I'll say it again. Um, you've impacted my life in big ways, and and you're impacting the larger church in America and really around the world. And uh, I just want to encourage you to find what you can that this brother has written, uh, wherever you can find him online, uh, whatever he's talking about. This will be online a bit later. Um, but Brian, we are so thankful that you took time to come and be with us here in this place. We're better for it. We've been drawn closer to Jesus, and we're never going to be the same as a result of your being here tonight. Thank so thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So before we head down, um, and you're going to sign some books before you head out tonight, I hope you'll pick up this book tonight before you leave. But we would love, I'd love for you to pray over us, just really a, as a brother, as a friend who understands what's happening in this world, pray over us as a church, not all of us from the same church, pray over Dallas. Amen. Would you, would you offer that? Let's, let's
Let's just do that as we close. Yeah, okay. let, let me just uh, just kind of one quick anecdotal thing. You know, I, my heart was really stirred. Uh, I just read John Meacham's, um, I think it was John Meacham's biography on John Lewis. Mm. I, I think John Lewis is the most courageous person in the civil rights movement. Uh, Freedom Rider, 1961, mm -hmm. pulls into Fort Mill or Rock Hill, South Carolina, one of those. And as soon as he gets off the bus, a guy by the, a white guy by the name of Elwin, I forget Elwin's last name, starts beating him. And John Lewis, just a Christian man, 21 years old at the time, John Lewis says, I just remember my training in nonviolence and just saying, it's not, a, it's not good enough for me to not fight back. It's not good enough for me to not hate him. I must actively love him in this moment. So that happens. John Lewis ver barely survives. For the next several years, Elwin cannot get that scene out of his mind. Elwin becomes a follower of Jesus. 48 years later in 2009, Elwin calls John Lewis and says, look, man, I love Jesus. Will you forgive me? John forgives him, and they go on speaking tours together until the end of their lives. Yeah. I just say that to say, by this will all men know that you're my disciples, by the love that you have for one another. And I just want to pray that over us. Love isn't tolerance. Tolerance is such a low ethic. I tolerate you. We're not called to tolerate. We're called to love. And so, Father, I just, I just pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray, Lord God, that the church of Jesus Christ in Dallas will rise up against the gates of hell and the principalities of power. Yes. And that the outside world would go, look at how they love. Authentic love that transgresses economic lines, that transgresses ethnic lines, that says, I'm going to love you. I'm going to love my neighbor. And who's my neighbor? Luke 10 tells me it's everyone I see, yes. even the ethnically other. Yes. So God, would you, just, would, would you just do that? There's some people in this room, they have roots of bitterness in them. Very real traumatic pain has happened along these racial lines. Um, I pray that your spirit will deal with that. What we don't transform, we will transmit. And we don't want to transmit bitterness, cynicism. God, transform that pain in our lives. We don't want to be like Jonah, who was so angry with you that your grace wasn't just for Jews. It was for the ethnically other. God, we want, we want a gospel heart. Yes, God. Because Jesus died for the sins of the world, we want to lay our lives down. Yes, for everyone. Yeah. So God, would you just give that to us, we pray. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Brian, thank you, Bill. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right, Jess, we'll head out this way. Y'all, I said you were in for a treat, right? That was so good. Um, tonight's conversation is gonna be posted on our website on YouTube. We'd love for you to go watch it again if you need to. I'm gonna be watching it again. Share it with your friends. Uh, let's, get, let's get more advocates and let's have them here in our city. So um, please watch out for that. Uh, we're about to go out these back doors to the commons, which is just down the stairs of the elevator right behind you. We've got snacks, we've got drinks, we've got books. Uh, get your books signed uh, and, and meet somebody new. Uh, we'd love for you to meet somebody new tonight. Uh, and we want to make sure that you know the next conversations worth having is going to be in November, November 12th. We'll have birds and bees right here. Uh, make sure if you have got friends with, uh, with young kids, this is for parents of young kids, uh, make sure to invite them. This is a great equipping course for parents. We'd love to have you join us. Um, and we're, we're so excited for the, that next one. So we're thankful that you came tonight. We hope you have a, a wonderful week. And we'll see you in the comments.